Greetings, I'm Dr. Brian Williams, president of McCall College and also a bio and social ethicist. The lectures I'm offering tonight, and this is lecture 1B that I'll be offering this evening, is, is entitled Helping Healthcare Become Healthy and Caring. We will also be constructing a Pacific Northwest bioethic. And I trust you enjoy the lecture this evening as we struggle to help healthcare become healthy and caring. The course outcomes that we'll be wanting to accomplish for our time together, and this will be probably an eight lecture series, uh, and, uh, and so it's approximately eight hours worth of material. We're now in that second hour, lecture 1B. The course outcome is to introduce deep truth and to assess complex thought. We'll be wanting to introduce bioethics and its role in society. We'll want to recognize that moral principles as are, are often symmetrical. Moral principles are often symmetrical. Current bioethics uses four principles, which I'll define to be four static principles. And I'll want to improve what we have with four dynamic principles able to oscillate in crisis. So we're gonna go from four static principles to four dynamic principles able to oscillate in crisis. We'll be introducing the seeds of a new political theory, and we'll be working towards holistic unity via symmetrical principles in dynamic tension. And the whole point of what we're trying to work on is we want to be able to see pathways to solutions for major social problems. I'm glad you're with me. Who am I? As I've already introduced myself, I'm Dr. Brian Williams. I have a PhD from University of Southern California, and that's in social ethics with an emphasis in bioethics. I serve as president of McCall College, a small private college in McCall, Idaho. I serve as an associate prof professor in social and bioethics and healthcare. My wife, Lynette, is an artist, and she has an academy called We Da Vinci Academy, and she also has her own art studio. We have three boys, Ian, who's CEO of Idaho Shirt Company, Austin, who has a company called Adventure Weddings. He's in Meridian, Idaho. And Lincoln, who's here in McCall, and he works for Albertsons. We have a wonderful family. A little more about myself. I have a heart for the working families in McCall. Our family is one of the largest providers of affordable single family housing in McCall. I've served as founder of McCall College and also the West Central Mountains Leadership Academy. And those are the two primary emphases that we've had since we arrived in McCall about 11 years ago. McCall College focuses on the GED to give students a fresh start and an opportunity to restart their education. We also emphasize culinary arts with an apprenticeship in our local restaurants. And we have computer science with an emphasis in Python. And so if any of those are interesting to you, we'd love to hear from you. I like to define my life as a life in symmetry, symmetrical life and practice. My academic focus is seeking wholeness by helping the parts fit well. I try and help students understand the holistic symmetrical structure 
of moral development leading to excellence. And my work is built on the shoulders of giants. And the giants that I often refer to are Aristotle and his doctrine of the mean or the golden mean as we see in his ethics. I build my work on St. Thomas Aquinas and his Summa Theolog Theologia on faith and reason. I build my work on John Wesley's Via Media. And that particular uh, excellence is built on the pathway between the Catholic community and the Protestant community. And during Wesley's time, trying to find a Via Media was a real challenge. I also look to the, to the Pacific Rim, and there I have enjoyed studying Taoism's yin and yang, and you see that symbol in your top corner. I try and be holistic, so I not only look at the parts, but I look at the whole. And hol hol holistic understanding means seeking unity by appreciating the parts. And please note that I prefer to spell the word with the W. When you uh, evaluate the spelling of that word holistic, it's usually spelt starting with an H. But for this, for this um, uh, uh, work, I will be adding the W to see the holistic nature of the word itself. So holistic is seeking unity by appreciating the parts. Symmetry is the correspondence of opposite sides of a median plane. And if you look at that symbol, you'll see that there are opposing sides, but they're corresponding. And you can draw a plane down that particular symbol, and you'll see how it functions on both sides. And the yin-yang isn't the greatest example of, of symmetry, mainly because it's got those interesting dots in the middle. Uh, but there's other examples I'll try and use later on to show symmetry as well. You can also say that yin and yang is complementary, and there'll be times I'll use that word as well, and the complementary nature is also a feature of the work. But I prefer holistic symmetry as the definition of my work. My work draws from biology, and I have my undergraduate degree is in biology, and my graduate work has also been in genetics. So I draw from biology and genetics with our bodies being symmetrical yet opposite, bonding for life. I draw from math with symmetrical shapes, building the universe. I draw on physics with light being a particle with mass and a wave with no mass. We'll come back to that as that's Einstein and Bohr's deep truth. I draw on faith, where in Christianity, there is that particular edict from, from Jesus to love your enemy. And I also have my own sayings. A truth claim that is opposite to another claim, yet they both might be true. If so, that's a deep truth, holistic morality. Let's examine our pathway of exploring bioethics. And by that exploration, our goal will be to improve healthcare. And by improving healthcare, we'll be able to improve society. Here are some of the questions that we'll be asking. And bioethics might be new to some of you, and we'll certainly be often working our terms. And so we can, we can even begin with bioethics, and we'll probably come back to that. But bio means life, and ethics means the study of morality. And so we'll be studying life and the moral claims of life. Again, I'll keep reviewing the key words so that you have an understanding of what's happening with those words. But we're gonna have some key questions that we're going to try and answer. 
And so our first week, and this is our lecture one and a, uh, 1A and 1B, tonight's 1B, we'll be answering the, the questions, what is moral symmetry? What is bioethics? What are bioethics as for virtues? And why does one of those virtues, autonomy, why does its failure during the pandemic, an important starting point for understanding the principles and the weaknesses of those principles? And so that will be our first week. Our second week, we'll be asking, how does bioethics work? We'll be introducing bioethics analysis, and we'll have an example of the God Committee and kidney dialysis. For the third week, and again, each one of these will bro be broken up into two lectures, A and B, for YouTube and our YouTube audience. So week three, we'll ask the question, how do we build a vibrant bioethics community in Idaho? We'll ask the question, bioethics is social and therefore political. That was more a statement than a question. But we will ask the question, what is a better political theory? And finally, on week four, A and B, we'll ask the questions, how can we make our health care healthy and caring? We'll be introducing an, a new yet old 21st century Pacific Northwest bioethic, which introduces holistic, symmetrical ethics. What problems now will we be addressing in our journey together? These will be linked social problems. And those problems and possibly one of the most challenging problems we all must face is individuals are faced with beginnings and end of life decisions with little preparation. There is very little conversation on this topic. How do we deal with beginnings? And one of the catch uh, terms that we can all talk about is abortion, but it's also birth uh, and how do we begin well? And then the question of end of life decisions with all of its challenges on how to die well. And we don't get any preparation or very, we get very little preparation. It's not a topic that we often broach in our families or those close to us. And because of that, that certainly is a major problem for our society. Corporations and institutions that are racked with moral struggles that resist solutions. And the newest problem that is racking corporations and institutions is artificial intelligence. And that is awakening. And so that will be one of the freshest conversations we may have is how do we begin to think about artificial intelligence and how will bioethics serve as an assisting tool as we all discover artificial intelligence together. Another social problem that we'll be talking about is the dissonance between religion and science over the philosophies of origin. And so this has been a, a, a many uh, centuries back into the mid 1800s uh, when, when Darwin uh, introduced his particular perspective on a philosophy of origin and that seemed to be in contradiction to so many religious beliefs. And that created the dissonance that we now, that we now feel between religion and science. We have another problem with poorly trained professionals in morality and ethical theory. And so there's very few pathways. And so ethics is classically taught in our philosophy departments, uh, and sometimes in our religion departments, it's usually taught at a graduate level, though there may be individual courses in ethics that you may have taken or heard about, and those may be available to undergraduates. But for so many, the study is at a graduate level, whether it's master's or whether it's a doctoral level. 
Uh, and so that really restricts the opportunity to become trained in, in morality and ethical theory. And so that's what I mean by that there's very few pathways that people can take to achieve a, a better understanding of morality and ethical theory. But there's a, there's a significant de demand for moral resources to solve intransigent moral problems and the polarized solutions. And so we don't have that many folks that are trained in the area, and yet we all are existing in institutions and in corporations that struggle daily with uh, uh, moral dilemmas and their background in ethical theory may be reasonably light. And so that creates a dissonance at that level too. One of the final areas of a, of a social problem is that we've privatized our pastors. And what that means is that our, our pastoral community used to be a leading voice within the uh, addressing of social problems in our society. But as we've moved out of the 1960s and for the last 50 years, pastors have moved into the more privatized spaces of their churches. Our priests have typically done a better job of being in the community, uh, but they too have been reasonably, reasonably uh, sequestered into their parishes. Our African-American pastors have typically done a much better job of staying within the society, the society and addressing social problems. And so we look to their voice often as a public voice into social problems. But for the majority of pastors, I would argue, they become privatized. And certainly the major problem that we'll be dealing with throughout our lectures is poor, expensive healthcare. We've all seen those reports about how the healthcare that we have within the American context is not that good compared to so many around the world. And so if we were to divide it up a little bit, our, our primary healthcare seems to be quite weak and our tertiary or third level care or our specialist care tends to be very good. And so that's created problems for our families where primary care uh, we would hope to be exceptional and sadly it's not as good as we would hope. And our tertiary care, uh, which we need uh, often later in our lives, is wonderfully good. And so that becomes uh, my definition of poor health care. We have, to be exact, poor primary care when our families need it most. And the real challenge is that our health care is too expensive. Uh, and so the costs of health care have now risen to the point where it's unaffordable for the vast majority of those that need health care, all of us, and accessing that health care is too expensive. And when it's too expensive, we delay treatment. And that delay is costing people uh, as, as, uh, as they then are in a more difficult state when they arrive in their doctor setting or in the emergency room and care is that much more difficult and certainly much more expensive. And so the expense of healthcare must be addressed for us to come to the point of seeing that we have better healthcare. And so, and so our healthcare and our finances come together. And so when, when we look at our insurance and our insurance claims, the insurance claims that we, the insurance policies that we all hold really illustrate a significant problem in American healthcare. We're seeing all around us drugs that, that cost from 10,000 to a million dollars. These are now becoming routine. We're exceeding, we're seeing an accelerating copayment structure as costs shift to the consumer. And my experience this year is just one person's experience, but I watched our deductible for our family 
go from $250 an individual to $750 per individual for our coverage. And so that creates, not, that creates a real dilemma. When the cost, when our, our uh, paycheck cost has also gone up significantly, but our co-pays have also gone up. So that, so that it becomes to be less and less useful, even though it's becoming more and more expensive. So our accelerating copayment structures have shifted the costs to the consumer in a way that makes insurance much less affordable and much less useful. There's a declining choice of healthcare providers, and there's a desperate need for healthcare staff to thrive in quality environments. And it doesn't take too long of a conversation to see that we're, we're, we're losing healthcare providers in so many of our settings, and I'm in rural Idaho. And so the conversation here has been just that. Our healthcare providers are disappearing. And we're also seeing that when we talk to our healthcare staff, don't, they don't feel they're functioning in quality environments. And so that makes their experience as healthcare providers less meaningful to them and, and less rewarding for them. And that degrades the healthcare experience that the patient sees. And so we have to ask the question, who will serve as an effective moral voice in the midst of all these struggles? As we age, we become ill. And the last six months of each and every one of our lives, when, we'll, when we will consume the vast proportion of the healthcare dollars that we have available to us? What will happen when the cost of pharmaceuticals is $10,000 for you? What will happen when hospitalization is two hundred dollars or $300,000 for those last six months of our lives. How many estates will be able to handle that without emptying those estates for the future use of the families? And so we're arriving at a point where it will take everything we have to live the last six months of our lives. What resources do we have to minimize the influence of these problems? How do we prepare to solve these coming problems? And maybe the most important question is who? Who will be the problem solvers of our American? society. Let's take a look back in history at who were those that solved those problems in American society. As we've mentioned briefly, the challenge of being in ministry and its privatized uh, form that it's taking. Historically, ministry was the leading profession with emphasis on the human condition. And for, for uh, those uh, giants that we stood on for their shoulders, we often stood on the shoulders of Luther uh, with the Protestant Reformation, of Calvin with its, his important role in the development of America and the American context, of Wesley and his development of Methodism uh, and the importance of Methodism on the development of hospitals, and Aquinas for our Catholic community as he, he remains the leading voice in their understanding of the human condition. So those four names were seminal in their problem solving in American society uh, as we, and many of them were beginning in the, in the 12th century and leading up all the way to the 17th century. By the time we got into the 18th century, law overtook ministry with emphasis on human rights. And again, we see Calvin as his work uh, as a lawyer, uh, as well as a theologian, was important in shaping how the law 
could solve problems. But John Locke was crucial to the development of the Constitution and was read by those who were framing the Constitution. And so Locke's involvement in law was very important in helping to make it a valuable contribution in problem solving for American society. As we came into the 19th century, we began to see that medicine and science overtook law with an emphasis on human need. And we've already mentioned Charles Darwin uh, in the late 1800s, but we also must mention Mendel with his influence on genetics. And both of those proved to, to be important discoveries that helped shape the worldview of so many on how medicine and science could be helpful in helping us solve problems as humanity encountered them. In the late 20th century, computer science has made a significant inroad on problem solving. And when it's paired with business, it now becomes dominant. And we're seeing that in artificial intelligence with its dominating role in how we're going to solve problems as we type in our prompts and artificial intelligence gives us a vast array of possible solutions. And so that emphasis on computer science has done an amazing amount of work as we interconnect as human beings. And we call it social media, but it really is the improved social connection that Allah has allowed humans to connect and to participate in social problems with new tools. And the two names that are often mentioned are, are Bill Gates with Microsoft and Steve Jobs with Apple. And those two companies remain today to be dominating forces in helping us solve social problems. As we're now in the midst of the 21st century, we must ask who will protect the human condition in complex settings? Society's technical needs have often been dealt with by the various voices we have just outlined. When we have a problem in the scientific area now, we have to ask who will help us. We, because what we're being required to do is to rethink constantly our ethical and theological positions. Scientific advances are reshaping human identity. A force driven by genetics and Mendel, AI and medicine. And so scientific advances constantly gives us problems that we have to begin to re-examine to re and come up with solutions that are meaningful to most people. The intent of the profession of bioethics is to explore worldviews to help us see and integrate complexity. We need a worldview that allows us to see things differently. I simply call it a pair of glasses. And so what, what bioethics does is gives us a pair of glasses that we can see the world differently. And it allows us when we get in the midst of complex problems to integrate that complexity in a helpful way that allows us to approach solutions meaningfully. Bioethics helps us by giving us principles that will help us decide. We will discover the four major principles of bioethics, and those principles are age-old, and some are newer, but they help us to decide. Those principles will be beneficial as we move through the problems that we encounter. And it helps us to, to uh, by, by offering us a pathway of complex thinking in a simplistic setting. And so that we'll have to understand better as we begin to see things in complex fashion 
and make sure that our worldview helps us to manage that complexity. Because for, for many, many settings, we've had successful ways of living. And those I'll, I'll define as simple ways. And when it's simple and helpful and useful, we use it. And so complexity creates difficulties that we've got to be able to manage as we deal with all the problems that are coming at society and the human beings that inform society. And so there's existing opportunities for bioethicists. And so bioethicists provide rational patterns of thought to address resistant problems and practice possible solutions. And the bioethicists are entering into new fields. Classically, the bioethicist is busiest in our hospitals, and they often are the leaders of our ethics committees. And the vast majority of hospitals, major hospitals primarily, have ethics committees, and they're often informed by a bioethicist. But a bioethicist will also be found in federally contracted corporations, and that's often your ethics and compliance departments. A bioethicist uh, may often be found in your federal, state, or local ethics board. They'll often have positions at universities or colleges, and they'll also be private corporations. And one that uh, I encountered on my journey was entitled Ethics Point, and they all have ethicists that serve. But the dilemma that we're going to have to try and understand is why there's so few in Idaho. I think I'm the only PhD level bioethicist in the state of Idaho that I have encountered. And if you out there uh, are my colleague, please contact me so that I can see who else is out there at a PhD level. And so I would love to be, to update my numbers so that I could see that there are more. The dilemma for bioethicists, even in the hospital setting where they have a very distinct role, is they're often perceived as a cost and not a revenue stream. And so that's a great challenge for hospitals that try and cost cut. Uh, they try and minimize their costs, they try and improve their revenue streams. And their ph physicians and their medical staff uh, are generating revenue streams to the hospital. But so often the bioethicist is considered a cost. And so it's difficult to hire them and it's also easier to release them as their perception as a cost creates difficulties for them in difficult financial times. And so what are the tactics that bioethicists use as they're trying to inform hospitals and the various corporations on what they do? And so what we'll be doing tonight is we'll be introducing you to bioethical case studies. And so we'll be inviting you to, to do that together. And our case studies will be located on the ethics.center. And so if you were to go to your browser and you were to type in ethics, period, center, and hit enter, that will take you to the ethics center that's supported by McCall College. And you will be able to, to find the bioethical cases that will be needed for you to continue. As well, there'll be, there'll be other material available from the Ethics Center uh, for reading and for working through the various areas. But bioethicists use bioethical case studies to do their work. They practice tough situations in safe settings. And so, these, these case studies will help individuals to sense their own individual intuitions, to forecast the consequences of those intuitions, to broaden the recognition of those involved, to develop conceptions of foundational principles, and to integrate complexity to forge solutions. 
And so the case that we'll be introducing to you is on the Ethics Center, and I'd like to introduce you to your first case. And so for next week, uh, and I'll have to update these numbers, uh, but for our first case study, and this will be for our second group of lectures that, I, that I'm calling week two, even though our YouTube uh, lectures will be, will, will be a li developed a little dif different way. And so uh, I'll try and resolve this as quickly as I can. But our first case study is an innovative vaccine. You are an RN on an oncology ward of a major urban hospital. You have just finished reading a paper on a successful vaccine for metastatic breast cancer. The vaccine uses an individual's own tumor-fighting immune cells for treatment. Good efficacy and low side effects have been noted in the studies to date. The hospital has been able to acquire two doses of the vaccine. More doses are six months away. There are 20 patients with this cancer in your setting who could benefit from the vaccine. The oncologist has ordered the doses to be given to the youngest patient and another who is clearly financially well off. Both have insurance. You have a friend with no insurance who is excluded. You, as an RN of your, of your hospital, have asked for an ethics committee consult. What will you say at the meeting? And so I'd like for you to begin practicing tough decisions. You'll find a worksheet available on the Ethics Center that you'll be able to use to develop your response when you deal with the Ethics Committee. The first thing I like to encourage people to do is just allow their instinct to be documented. What is your instinctive response? What shapes your decision? And so you are already thinking about how you want to respond. You have a friend your instinct will undoubtedly be shaped by your friend and what the oncologist has already prescribed or defined. And so you have an instinctive response. Write it down. What shapes that response? I bet it's your friend. I bet it's what the oncologist has already done. I bet it's your, your uh, uh, own background in oncology. I bet it's your sense uh, of what a vaccine might do. There's some instinctive things that you'll want to document that. So please give yourself some he healthy responses. Then I want you to, co to consider two consequences that have resulted from this instinctive response. What are the, the consequences of that? If you make a statement for your friend, you've only got two doses. If you go before the Ethics Committee and you present a case about those that are financially well off, that will influence others that are financially well off. If you talk about how uh, a young person is, go is going to receive a dose, that will have consequences to the elderly. So however you have responded so far, give yourself some consequences of your response. Here the complexity is beginning as you're beginning to see what, how others will be shaped by your particular perspective on the use of this vaccine. Gather any facts available to you. Yes, you can go immediately and Google it, and that is available to you. But if you can, try and find better sources than just the hundreds or millions of responses that you will get from Google. Begin to reflect on some of those journals you might have seen, seen 
uh, in, a, in a good quality library. You might have seen uh, uh, resources like Medline. You might have seen quality medical journals uh, like the BMJ, or you might have seen the American Medical Journal, or you might have seen a number of good quality resources. Go and study up what this vaccine is. If you can, find some of the papers that have been delivered on this vaccine. But work as, as, as much time as you have available on the facts that you have available to you. Then I'd like for you to do a listing of all of your primary characters. Who are they? Obviously, you're a part of the story. Obviously, we've already talked uh, uh, that you have a friend in need. We've already talked about the two people uh, that will receive this vaccine. But there's more. Try and do a complete list. And what I like to do as a sociologist is I begin with the individual and then I move out. As far as I can, can imagine is useful. And so it's like when you throw a rock in a pond, there's where the rock lands, but there's instantly the waves that are moving out from where the, the rock hit the water. And there's many rings as it moves out. In every ethical dilemma, there are many rings of those that are involved. I'd like for you to move through and try and identify as many as you can so that we can see how these responses impact each individual. I'd like for you to frame one key ethical issue. This might be the hardest part of this assignment. I'd like for you to frame one key issue that you think is the most important as a competing claim between two parties. Should the first party do something or should the second party do something else? And often as we enter into these kinds of dilemmas, we begin to see that, there, that there's clearly two, indiv there's, there, there's three individuals that I can think of. There is the, the person that you want to help, and there are the two individuals that seem to be now defined as going to be helped. And so we have these three individuals. But as we think about it, is there, is there something else? Is there someone else? Are there groups of people that we should assess better? Should we assess those that are youngest and think about age as we assess youngest to oldest? Should we assess our age differently? Should we assess our financial uh, 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 access to healthcare differently? Do the poor deserve a seat at the table? Do the rich have a, a more important role that they play? Should there be a way of assessing their talents and gifts of these individuals to see what makes them uh, defined as the two that are available? And so there's many ways that we can begin, but I'd like for you to think of one that's important to you. Think about that one key issue. Should the first party do something or should the second party do something? And so I'd like for you to frame one key issue that you can reflect on. And then I'd like for you to be thoughtful on what are the specific tensions, principles, or rights that are, that are in tension. Clearly, we've already discovered some that are clearly in tension. And, and often in healthcare, we see that challenge between the young receiving care and the old receiving care, or the young not receiving care and the old receiving or not receiving care. So there's a clear tension there on age and, and how do we treat people uh, based on their age. We also see financial issues are often in tension. How do the poor get treated in healthcare? How do the wealthy get treated in healthcare? 
And so that's a clear tension that we've really ba basically begin, begun to explore that often erupts in healthcare. <coughs> And there's others that we've already begun. But I'd like for you to think about that. What principles, and again, we haven't exposed you to the principles of bioethics, but what principles? Uh, and again, if you go back to the beginning, let's, let's do an, uh, an easy one that we'll be talking about next time. And that's beneficence or doing good. How do we do, do, do well for others in a healthcare setting? And, and, the, and the dilemma is when we do well for someone, we give them a vaccine, we might be not doing well for someone else. They don't get the vaccine. So, that, so beneficence, we're gonna talk about next week uh, or in future lectures. And so I'd like for you to recognize that this is a principle. Uh, and it goes back all the way to Hippocrates and he clearly learned it from those that he studied with. Uh, that, uh, and so, Doing, doing good for others is an important principle that we want to live by. And there'll be others that we'll explore next time. So think about principles that are, uh, that are important to you. What are the rights? And an obvious one is right to life. Uh, and so we give people a vaccine and we, we give it to them because they have a right to life. And this vaccine will help them to live better and to live in a healthy fashion. And so the right to life is one right, but there's lots of rights. Can you think of any other rights and what tensions are created uh, as we begin to think about the rights? And then would you please develop an action plan? What would you like to do? How do you think this solution could be solved? And, and what uh, can, can, can we do uh, to, make, to make the best possible result? And so give us an action plan of your thinking. To help you in the development of this, I'd like to go back to the earliest days of bioethics in America. And we go back to 1962. And there was a life story. The magazine, some of you may have seen, of life uh, was a wonderful resource almost for the entire country, widely read across the country wonderful pictures that helped us to understand issues. Uh, and so there was a life story in 1962 of a group of people who were assembled to select participants for the first kidney dialysis machine. And so these people are gonna, these people are documented to struggle as you're now already struggling to try and come up with a reasonable result. And they had to select the few available slots for kidney dialysis. They were, there was only one machine, uh, or there was a limited number of machines. There was a broad amount of patients, and this was in Seattle. So there were lots of patients that came to their clinics uh, in need uh, of support for kidney disease and the first dialysis machine had been discovered. This story is a significant part of the development of the field of bioethics. And what I'd like for you to do again is to go to ethics.center and you will discover there a link to take you to the, uh, the case study and the reading that's associated with the case study. And so if you would discover those, uh, and read that material. Uh, I would prefer it if you could to read this before you did the case study. Uh, and so it will give you some wonderful background about how committees sorted out problems like that. And you'll begin to then respond and react to how they did it and how you might like to do it differently or like they did it. So it'd give you the opportunity of compare, compare and contrast. And so if you would read this before you attempt the case study, I think you will find this to be an important area. Well, what have we done with lectures 1A and 1B? We've introduced major problems that need pathways to solutions. We've introduced deep truth and assess how complex thought might be implemented. 
We've introduced bioethics and its role in healthcare. We've introduced holistic symmetry, and we've introduced case studies. And so I hope you feel the value of what we're doing together. And because of its importance is why this is so extended in its conversation. There's some important work we have to do. And I so appreciate you staying with me to this point as we begin to understand this particular part of healthcare. And so we also need to know how to improve healthcare. And so thank you for joining me on this second lecture, which I'm calling Lecture 1B, as we try and understand how do we make healthcare healthier and more caring. I'm Dr. Brian Williams. I thank you for staying with us. I look forward to our future lectures as we begin to understand and explore how bioethics can be a tool for making healthcare better. Thank <music> you.